JM on Cars is kindly sponsored by Car Vertical, the only car history checking service you'll need, which references more than 20 databases globally to make sure you don't buy a car with a hidden past. For a special discount on the service, please use the link in the description down below. And now, today's feature presentation. Hello everybody, yesterday was a really important day for Lotus, perhaps one of the most significant in the last 15 years, because they finally showed to the public their brand new car, the Emira. And Emira has a very difficult job to do, because, let's be honest here, for the next few years, that single car is going to have to carry the entire brand. Because it's replacing not just Evora, but Elise and Exige as well, albeit not a direct replacement for those, but they're now done. So whereas the Lotus car lineup was really three cars, now it's just the one. Let's be honest, nobody is going to be buying Evaya. As and when the much rumored SUV does appear, I think it's gonna appeal of course to a very different audience as well. And the same thing could be said when Lotus finally do build an all electric sports car that normal people can actually afford and will want to buy. So it was very well known for a long time. This was gonna be Lotus's final petrol powered car. And so it's a pretty important thing and something I'm sure they really wanted to get right. As I have quite a sort of historical connection with Lotus, I founded this channel on Lotus content. I was an Evora owner for two and a half years and spent a long time singing that car's praises. A lot of people have been asking me my opinions on this. So I wanted to sit down now that the, the car is out there and talk through some of my initial thoughts. Now, a couple of disclaimers. First off, I have yet to see the car in person. And if it's anything like most of the rest of the Lotus range, Evora in particular, it'll be a very, very different thing in the flesh than it is in pictures. Uh, also, at this point in time, and it's only about 12 hours since Lotus launched the car, a lot of the details, the specifics, the numbers have been kept deliberately vague. So gonna be a lot of guessing, posturing, and we'll just see how right I get that uh, as the details come forward. But initial thoughts, well, first off, the looks. I'm not really sold on it. Now from certain angles, for example, this, this side on angle, it's, it's pretty good. You got that little hint of a vire in the side with that new big intake. It seems a little bit more sort of sure of itself than the Evora did, which is always a bit of an awkward looking car because of the sort of two plus two layout. The front, I'm not sure what's going on because we appear to have the sort of air intake from an Exige and then they've gone with this very complicated sort of bonnet that's not really a bonnet because it doesn't open at the front, which again is very heavily Evaya influenced. Now I'm sure there's some sort of aerodynamic benefit to doing that. I've seen people sort of compare it with the Ferrari S-Duct, but you look at a Ferrari S-Duct and it's very obvious what it's doing and where the air is going. Uh, Lotus, I think, are being a little bit trickier with their air management or they're doing something I've just haven't realized. Again, when you stood next to the thing, I'm quite confident that you're gonna be able to sort of tell what's going on there, but just looks a little bit overstyled for me. Also, somewhat baffled, I mean, just completely bemused by Lotus's decision to use black for one of the launch cars. So there were two cars on the sort of big live reveal, a blue one, which had a via style wheels, and a black one. Black is not really a great color for trying to work out whether the lines of a car work at all or not. Yes, it's a popular color, but not, not for showing off. Manufacturers don't really tend to launch cars in black for a really specific reason. I have seen a, a lot of sort of people's, you know, suggested configurations. I'd personally go with the green with the tan leather interior because that's a pretty classic color combination. Um, and it's some solid yellow ones with all yellow on them seem to work really, really quite well. The rear, confuses me greatly because the rear to me looks exactly like the Alpine A110. Now you, you can tell fairly clearly from sort of some of the views of it and some of the specs that this is what I thought it was going to be and what it really should have been. It's, it's a rebodied, heavily reworked Evora. The giveaways are the fact that despite it being a two-seater, there is quite a bit of space behind the seats. And curiously, the one shot I haven't really been able to find easily is a shot showing the, the seats themselves, or the main portion of the seats, and what's behind them. Because I think if you look there, there'd be a giveaway that it's an Evora. If you look at the sort of overhead shots, you'll see the engine is more or less in the same place as it was in Evora, which is pushed right back. So it's sort of nearly rear-engined, but never did that car any harm. And so, yeah, the yeah, wheelbase identical is not gonna be an accident. The fact is still double wishbone all round, still hydraulic steering and all that jazz. So interior wise, it really is a big step up. This is a huge, huge leap forward. I mean, this is like a two generations leap forward over the Evora. Um, 
I'm going to reserve judgment on some of it. Uh, there's bits I really like, like the fact that Lotus are clearly going to annoy all of their hardcore customers by putting things like a nice stereo, which, by the way, in 2016, I said on the Lotus forums that Lotus really should partner with Kef, um, who at the time did not do anything automotive, and, um, and that's what they've done. So looks like they're taking my advice. Don't worry, Lotus. Check is in the post. No, invoice is in the post. That's the one. Anyway. Lots of nice leather and all that sort of stuff. Alcantara if you want it. Um, again, haven't really been able to judge the seats because they've sort of hidden them almost. Steering wheel looks nice. They sort of, they kind of made a big thing in one of the uh, pieces about it being unique because it's flat bottomed. Don't know if Lotus have got a really short memory, but even they themselves have made flat bottomed steering wheels in the past. So that's a little bit of an odd thing to say. Don't know what's going on there. Anyway, um, big screen in the middle. Uh, if they can make it work, that's great. Um, generally looks quite nice. There's enough physical controls to keep me happy. The Lambo style starter button thing is a total gimmick. Lotus don't need it. They shouldn't be really getting into that sort of thing. Same as uh, I saw in the car fiction video walking around this car where um, Gavin Kershaw, who's the head of dynamics, uh, admitted that the fact they're using 20 inch wheels on the front came from the design department and not the engineering department. That's sad. That's not what Lotus um, should be like. Uh, but generally the interior looks good. It's, you know, they've, they've got cup holders and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's a general improvement. It looks like a really nice place to spend some time. I mean, the other thing as well that I'm absolutely in no doubt of whatsoever is that that car is going to drive amazing. Now, I believe there's going to be sort of two chassis setups on offer, a sort of Touring and a Sport, and I bet most people are going to go for Sport, and I bet that's probably going to be the wrong one, because the Touring is going to be the one that drives like a Lotus, is going to handle amazingly on the back roads, which is where people are actually going to be driving this most of the time, and that's probably going to work really, really well. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the, 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 you know, the oily bits. We now have a choice of two engines. You've got a AMG sourced uh, inline uh, four cylinder two liter that's come out the A45, not the A45S. Lotus on, their, Lotus on the launch were a little bit vague. They said power output's gonna be 360 to 400 horsepower. Well, on their own website, they then said that the four, uh, four cylinder is 360 horsepower, which means that the three and a half liter supercharged Toyota V6 is gonna be 400 horsepower which is not even quite as powerful as it was in the last of the Evoras. They've also said that the price is going to be starting from under £60,000, which means £59,995, but they haven't said what that actually gets you. I'm guessing that's going to be the sort of basic four-cylinder with nothing on it, and then the V6, and they're doing this first edition, which has the V6 in it, that's going to be a lot more. I've heard rumoured about £85,000 as a price, which then means it's not actually dramatically cheaper than Evora was, and Evora struggled to sell. I suspect this is probably going to sell really well in its first year. Saying that, I have probably given it the commentator's curse, because I said the GI Yaris probably was going to struggle to find buyers, and as it turns out, those have got a massively long waiting list, so what do I know? But Evora never, ever, ever sold. Part of that is because they just never marketed it well and never really did the right thing for it. The car was inherently brilliant. I spent two and a half years trying to tell people that, and you know what? Nobody really listened. So anyway, because this is an Evora underneath, I'm pretty confident that when people do get in it and drive it, it's going to be amazing. Unfortunately, I'm unlikely to do that for the next couple of years because I'm definitely not getting a press car from Lotus. Uh, one of the other things they've mentioned here, which does worry me, is that they've said the target weight is 1,405 kilos in lightest form. Now, that, given Lotus's recent sort of inability to use a set of scales properly, I would say that means that, practically speaking, it, it has put on some weight over it for. I mean, it has to. If it's basically the same chassis underneath, and it's got a lot more luxury and toys in it, it's got to be heavier. By how much remains to be seen. The price is also going to be quite important because at sixty thousand pounds, you know, this is a competitor for a seven eighteen Cayman S, and even say the AMG four cylinder is going to produce kind of the right numbers to you know make you be able to compare the two cars. However, if the V six is then sort of eighty five thousand pounds, ninety thousand pounds with options again, that's going to start making you compare it with stuff like the Cayman GT four or the GTS four liter. Not a car that I really loved. But a lot of other people do, and that's going to start getting really, really tricky. And this is what happened to Lotus last time, where everyone went, yeah, the Aurora was brilliant, wasn't it? But, but they all bought Porsches instead. I hope that doesn't happen. I really hope this is a roaring success, and Lotus can't build enough of them. 
Speaking of the human touch, it is really disappointing to see that Lotus have now swapped the paint shop for a bunch of robots. I'm sure they're going to do the job a lot technically better than they did before. However, I kind of liked how really truly handmade the car was. After all, one of their taglines is handmade in Hethel. So if you're starting to replace the hands with evil robot hands, uh, brackets, you know, asterisk, uh, robots may not actually be evil. Um, also, I try and be polite to the robots all the time because come the uprising, I hope they'll remember that. Lotus have just spent an absolute fortune on this new production facility where they're going to build the car and, fingers crossed, this means that quality will also be a lot better than it was previously. Now, this is never a given and this is where Lotus management, I hope, will get things really, really right because, you see, there are other companies out there, who I won't name but they rhyme with McLaren, who've got these lovely, brilliant, shiny, brand new facilities. But the problem is, if you don't use them correctly and you don't apply quality control, you're still going to have lots and lots of issues with your cars. Uh, it's a shame as well that you know, Lotus do keep talking about the whole uh, lightweight thing, and 1400 kilos is not particularly light. It makes it same weight if not heavier than a Cayman and considering that the Lotus is all aluminium and fiberglass is a bit of a disappointment and it shows you that they're kind of building it on a slightly older platform now there's a lot of stuff in the Evora which wasn't actually particularly lightweight you know bits of it were the chassis was really good and all that jazz but once you start taking a heavy supercharger on the engine and all this kind of jazz, like it just becomes a little bit awkward. Uh, another giveaway that this is just an Evora, by the way, is the fact that your storage space is a small section in the rear of the engine compartment, which I suspect is going to be exactly the same shape as it was with Evora, and your majority of storage goes behind the seat. So I'm hoping that's going to be nice and easy to get to. Um, and the whole general profile is very Evora-ish. I thought they might have sort of taken the opportunity to change the layout a little bit more dramatically but I suspect they wanted to be somewhat conservative because Evora was a car that could still pass all of the sort of modern crash regulations and stuff like that and if you change the formula too much then you do run the risk of having to do a hell of a lot of work to make sure the car is going to pass all of that kind of jazz. And the fact is, the development team did not have long on this car. So I'm, I'm glad to see that they have focused on some really key areas, you know, interior quality and um, all that jazz. The real disappointment for me is that they didn't seem, or they haven't so far seemed to fix what was the Evora's Achilles heel. For a 400 horsepower car, Evora never really felt that quick. And that was largely down to the gearbox, because the gearbox was at its torque limit. It just could not take any more. And reading between the lines here, I get the impression that they haven't changed the gearbox at all. Maybe I'm wrong, but... I expected this car to launch with at least 450 horsepower. To them say it's got 360 or 400 is a little bit baffling. It seems like something of a backwards step. So whether we're going to get a higher powered version in the near future, and I suspect we will, I hope also we're going to get a convertible version because that really would be the big seller. That would be a car that would get me genuinely really interested. If they could make the sort of, you know, the Evora Spider that they always promised and, and never made, that would be amazing. Perhaps that's one of the reasons that they haven't launched this as a 2 plus 2. I'm kind of surprised if it's got the space in the back that they didn't do that because I know a lot of Evora customers did buy it for the plus two element. Most Evora 400 people that I knew did have kids in the back. So it's a little bit odd some of the decisions that they've made. You know, this does take out a whole lot of potential customers that were buying Evora because of its ability to carry small people behind you. So there's still quite a few unanswered questions with Emira, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how Lotus answer those. You know, stuff like what is the pricing structure going to be? What other models are you going to bring to the lineup? Uh, what's your warranty going to be like? What's your service plans going to be like? It's all the little detail stuff. You know, are they going to be doing extended warranties with a Lotus product? I think that's really important because faith in the mechanicals is not going to be particularly good. I expect that they will sell really quite well in the first year because there's going to be a whole bunch of people out there that have been dying for a new Lotus product that just haven't bought one because there hasn't really been one for the last sort of 10 years. So I'm sure it'll do quite well to start off with. However, what I'm really keen to see is whether international demand is high you know, in, in areas where Lotus hasn't sold so well. You know, USA never really was that interested in Evora until they discounted the bejesus out of it. Um, and even then it didn't sell so good. And also, you know, in other territories too. So again, places like Japan, they were always really big into, say, the Elise. But will they buy this? Which we'll see. Japan's always been a very strong Lotus market. And the pricing too. That's going to be really, really key. You know, if Lotus say, yeah, cool, no, brilliant. We are going to make a, a 500 horsepower um, V6 supercharged one. We fix the gearbox. You know, it's going to make all the talk all the time and all that jazz. Um, 
going to be a, a little bit tricky if it's then, you know, £100,000. Really disappointing to see that no real effort has been made to try and you know, match a DCT with the V6. Um, that I thought was just going to be a given. I just figured that's what was going to happen. Um, so I gather that the transmission options are exactly as they were before. You know, Also, you can't have the four-cylinder, I believe, with a manual. So that, again, I think will probably upset some people who might want the absolute lightest, purest configuration. Um, I hope they do a decent job with the DCT. The old AMG DCT wasn't great, but I haven't, haven't tried the new one. Also slightly baffling that they've chosen to use the lower powered version of that engine. Presumably, if you gave it the full fat AMG A45S version, it would just walk all over the V6. So um, I'm very curious to see. I am glad though, that the one number I haven't seen quoted here is a Hethel lap time. Now maybe they have put one out there and I just, I just missed it, but I'm really glad to see that actually all of the focus on this launch has been on the usability, on the styling, you know, on, on how it feels and all that kind of stuff. All these things I think are really core Lotus values rather than simply going around the track quicker than everyone else. Because if you start going down that route, you're probably gonna find that other people can do that better. And if you're really that much of a dedicated track hound, there's always a way to go around a track quicker for less money anyway than a regular road car. So overall, it's a kind of cautious optimism from me with the Amira. I need to see it in person because in pictures, it, it doesn't work. It, it just doesn't. It just looks a bit wrong. But then Evora always did from a lot of angles. Some it worked brilliantly, some it didn't. So I'm hoping this has been overall a little bit more successful. I thought it was going to be a slightly more radical departure from what Evora was in terms of the mechanics, but... Like I said, there are benefits to them playing it a little bit safe in that regard. So, fingers crossed, and uh, good luck to you, Lotus. You're going to need it.